Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> and welcome to this session. We're going to be looking at how you um, cultivate creativity and curiosity through the arts in education. I'm Christina Patterson. I'm a writer, columnist, and broadcaster. And I'm delighted today to be here with Andreas Schleicher, who's um, Director of Skills and Education at the OECD, who you will have heard earlier. And then three finalists in the Global Teacher Prize. Uh, we have, um, oh, I've lost, I've got their names now. Uh, Melissa Morris, um, David Reed, no, Mark. Mike, Mark Reed, I'm so sorry, and uh, Ronnie Cheng there. And they are, the reason I don't have them is I was told they were going to introduce themselves and I instantly forgot their names. So in a moment, they're all going to um, give a very brief introduction and then they are each going to speak for 10 minutes and then because this is not a panel discussion and we do not have panel discussions at this conference apparently, we are going to open up to you in the audience. Um, and I'll probably take questions in clusters, but we'll see how that goes. Now, my own background is a bit relevant to this discussion in that I did a degree in English literature, and then I did an MA in the novel, and then I worked in publishing. I worked for a company called Faber & Faber, which publishes literary fiction and poetry, and uh, along with nonfiction and other categories as well. Then I worked at the South Bank Centre, which is one of the world's biggest art centres, putting on literary events, poetry events, discussions, and working alongside visual artists, dance programmers, and musicians. Then I ran a, a British national organisation called the Poetry Society, which was involved both with um, arts education and with campaigning. We had a national poetry competition, we had a venue, we had a cafe. And then I made a midlife transition to journalism, and I ended up as a columnist at The Independent, um, waking up in the morning, listening to a program we have there called the Today Program, thinking, oh my God, what's the big issue of the day? And it might be the budget, it might be the extradition of Abu Qatada, or whatever. And essentially, and that piece would be the lead column in the paper on that subject. So I kind of learnt how to analyse budgets and political shifts essentially by analysing Shakespeare and Keats. So I'm a kind of example of how what you learn in the arts can be transferable and help you in your critical thinking in other areas. But I'll be really interested to hear what the others have got to say on that matter. Because the other thing I noticed in my time as an arts administrator was that many people would make rather bold claims of the arts. And I was guilty of this myself. If you want arts funding, uh, you have to go cap in hand and you constantly have to look at the current criteria and in what way uh, the arts can foster this, that or the other. So I would have to go to the Arts Council and say, kind of argue things like poetry improves your employability and communication skills. And I felt like saying to them, actually, have you ever met a poet? Because, you know, frankly, the correlation isn't always all that obvious. So we ha having this discussion at a time when big things are happening in the world, uh, President Trump seems to be in the process of cutting pretty much all arts funding in the US. We've got um, axes falling on education funding, and quite often the arts are the area that goes but that go first. So it's a, it's a kind of challenging time. And in the past few years, the emphasis has tended to be on STEM subjects for fairly obvious reasons. Now, clearly, those are very important, but maybe we can argue that nuance is more important than ever in a time of alternative facts, subtlety, the ability to argue, all of these things. So I will be very, very interested to hear in particular what Andreas has to say about the evidence from the OECD on this front and very very interested to hear about the experience on the ground of the teachers. So I'm going to ask you first to introduce yourselves all briefly and then we'll go into your presentation. So Melissa first. Hi, I'm Melissa <coughs> Morris. I teach in Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> You're telling me this. Should I say that again or you got that? <laughs> Brooklyn in the house? All right. 
Um, I actually, I, I was nominated for the Global Teacher Prize by a former colleague of mine who was at James Madison High School, where I am now. Um, but when I was no nominated, I was teaching in Staten Island, New York, at a very small high school, 500 students, and it was an international studies high school, so I was charged with building a music program from the ground up that made sense for an international studies school, and that's, I guess, my claim to fame. And then from there, um, I've moved back to James Madison High School into a 3,500 students, 200 faculty, so I'm a, a little bit of a culture shock, a little bit of a shift, and um, nine different languages, and they're all, most of them immigrants coming in daily, actually. So I'm loving my new challenge. It's a, definitely a challenge, but um, I'm in a building with seven music teachers and seven arts teachers, so I don't know how Trump's getting rid of 14 <laughs> teachers. Uh, my name is Mark Reed, and I'm from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. No, no. Oh, thank you. There you go. Thank you. I didn't want to have to get out my hockey stick and you know have a word here. Uh, I uh, I spent nine years teaching in uh, East Vancouver at a high school called Vancouver Technical Secondary School. It's the oldest technical school, uh, technical and trades, or vocational school in Western Canada, uh, established in 1914. What's really interesting about uh, my departure from that school where I taught band and choir and orchestra is that after uh, being a top 50 finalist in 2015, I found myself uh, as part of a curriculum writing team for our Ministry of Education and then subsequently uh, invited uh, in to work at the ministry uh, on secondment. So I'm still a Vancouver teacher, but I'm on leave and uh, on loan to work at the ministry. I do two things at the Ministry of Education right now. One of them is to coordinate the development of applied design skills and technologies curriculum, which is a suite of the uh, traditional departments we might call home ec or business ed, tech studies, tourism, uh, a, you know, a few things like that. The other half of my job is the development of a provincial music education strategy, which is a really wonderful experience because it's looking at certainly much more than, uh, than just instruction, but all of the different pillars that would be required to be supporting uh, uh, what goes on in the province. And that hasn't been announced by the minister yet, but it's the worst kept secret by our uh, ministry, so you're allowed to know that much. I'm Andrea Schleicher. Um, I work at the OECD where I'm in charge of our work on education and skills. And uh, we do many things, actually. We compare the performance of education systems, looking at learning outcomes. And the field of arts is still one where we struggle. It's very, very hard to capture those kinds of ideas. But we've looked at other fields and also the interaction between education and arts and music and outcomes on the cognitive side, but also outcomes that are important from a social emotional perspective. There's a lot of really interesting research, also brain research now emerging that highlights this kind of work. So that's where I come from. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ronnie K. Yan Cheng. I'm from Hong Kong. Um, this is my 25th year as an educator. I spent the first 20 um, teaching music, uh, as well as uh, being uh, the deputy headmaster of the school, establishing the IB program. Um, when I was a music teacher, I worked with the choirs and the orchestras, kind of like Mark. And now, for the past five years, I've been working as the principal of the school. I, I literally grew up in the school from primary one to uh, grade 12, and then went to college, came back, and taught, and now I'm the principal. I think I'll retire or die there. <laughs> <laughs> I actually got married in the school hall, so. <laughs> Maybe the memorial service will be held there too, <laughs> hopefully. But, but I have the unique uh, perspective of a frontline teacher and now as an administrator, and I'm trying to support my staff, my colleagues, and my students as much as possible. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. During our recent Brexit campaign, we were told that we've had enough of the experts. Well, we haven't at this conference, so we would like to, first I'd like to hear some of the evidence from the OECD, please. So over to you, Andreas. Thank you. Can I get my presentation loaded? Yeah, and can I see it in front of me as well, or that's not possible? Um, perfect, thanks so much, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Good teamwork. The last thing I need to is put this presenter on, and then we're done. Thank you 
Excuse me, can you help me with the... Good. The first thing I wanted to sort of show you is just how much variation there is in countries in the time, and you can, you can make a compromise. <laughs> the, f the first thing that I wanted to show is really how much variation there is among countries in the importance that we give to instruction in arts. Now, you look at a country like Denmark and Finland, where this is almost 20%. I mean, you can look at countries like Poland, Israel, and Mexico, where you talk just a, couple, a few percentage points. It's a huge variation in the emphasis that the arts get in different countries' curricula. No? And the first thing you notice, you know, Finland is also a country that does extremely well in math and science and reading. No? So it doesn't seem to be a zero-sum game. Doing more arts doesn't mean we're doing less in other subjects. And I think that's a very important lesson we can take already from this data that actually the correlation between the emphasis that you put on arts does not you know, relate in any negative way to the performance in other kinds of disciplines. And again, this thing doesn't work. Can you just... Yeah. The other point I wanted to make is actually, let's have a look at the kind of skills that are particularly important for innovation today. When you look at people who are very innovative jobs, you ask them, you interview them, what skills made a huge difference for them? You can see, you know, coming up with new ideas, that's no surprise, you know, that's what innovation is about. Acquiring new knowledge, willingness to question ideas, alertness to opportunities, present ideas in an audience. And that's where you can see the connections with the arts, particularly the performing arts, already very clear. And analytical thinking, master of your own field, coordinate activities, and so on. So there are many aspects of, of skills that are important for innovation that you can already now intuitively relate to basically um, the arts as we teach them. I wanted to also show you something that is very important. You know, again, some people see this as a zero-sum game. You know, you teach more arts, it means less mass. And there's always this kind of fight, you know, how do we actually optimize the design of curriculum? But what uh, one of the things that is very interesting is that we see in many, in many areas this evidence is correlational. Now we see, for example, that there is a positive correlation between people skilled in the arts and in math and science and language and other subjects. But in some areas, we can now even speak of a causal impact. Now we know, for example, that there is a causal relationship between music education and intelligent and also academic achievement. Now, that is very important. We can now prove this is not just that the two go together, no, but that there is a clear ca ca causal impact. Now, how does this causal impact, how is this conveyed? That is still under study. Now, first of all, of course, it's another school-like study. It's more time spent with people around you, so that could be one of the reasons why doing more music also do, that helps you do better on academic achievement. Uh, the second part, I want to highlight this, is it's often you know, a relational issue. When you do mu music, you relate with other people. You re relate with a teacher, and those is, is another area which could actually positively influence outcomes. And also, it is mediated by conscientiousness. Now, you, I played the violin for many years. You know, you really have to study hard. You have to be very precise. You hear mistakes immediately. You know, so those aspects all could reinforce that kind of relationship. We do not know the nature of the causal relationship, but we do know that there is an important relationship between doing better on music and doing better in the kind of arts subjects. We also know that classroom drama strengthens verbal skills. It's not a surprise. You know, that's what classroom drama is about. But we can actually measure this. We can look, for example, at the relationship with writing a story and understanding, writing oral story understanding, reading readiness, and so on. And some of the correlations, you know, for those of you who have a statistical background, when I talk about a correlation of 0.45, that is pretty robust. No? links are pretty close. So actually, that is very important that we see those kinds of relationships. Dance also has something that uh, has been proven to have an impact on visual and spatial skills. Now, that's something important. Tentative evidence, and this is important. You know, I talked about academic outcomes. We also see very important relationships with motivational outcomes. 
attendance, persistence, dropout, engagement, not all of those seem to be positively related to arts and music education. Again, this is correlational, this is much harder to get to the issue of cause and effect. And um, social and behavioral skills, no. self-concept, self-efficacy, emotional regulation, empathy, perspective taking, all of those, particularly we talk about the performing arts, theater, we can see actually very close relationships. So actually, we do see relationships on the academic side, on the social and emotional skill side as well. And I think this is some, some, some of that is really, really interesting. The most interesting evidence now doesn't emerge from large-scale surveys where we have correlations, but actually from brain research. So I think that's something that I encourage you to look at. And I'm gonna skip that. Can I just advance to the next slide? I want to basically sort of come to a conclusion. Why do we do arts education? As some people say, there is a positive correlation between arts and math, and therefore we should teach art. No. I would argue, no, if you want to teach math, teach math. No. Arts education is not just a function to teach academic disciplines. Uh, I think if that would be all, I don't think we should, um, <clears throat> we should talk about arts. I think there is a clear argument to be made, arts for the art's sake. In itself, you have seen there are important ingredients in innovative capacity of people which become more and more important that relate to arts irrespective of the relationship with academic outcomes. So I think that is a very, very important point that I want you to bear in mind. Um, now for example, it contributes to innovation. The share of graduates who have a highly innovative job, you know, engineering, computing is number one, while well, that's what innovation largely is about. But arts is second. No? It's really interesting when you look at the people, where do they end up? Arts actually comes out very high when it comes to sort of the share of graduates who have a highly innovative job. So this is not just about being good in math and science and, and history, but also in itself an important driver for the outcomes that we observe. Um, there are sort of collateral benefits. I already talked about the music education focusing on hearing, verbal skills, visual spatial skills, visual arts education, observing and envisioning, theater education, lots of dimensions, and so on. So there are important interrelationships with skill dimensions that we value in today's society. Now, particularly when you think about social skills, they're actually very hard to teach in the context of a math and science lesson. Not important, not impossible, but probably we do better on this. There is also things that education in general could learn from arts education. I want to highlight a few. First of all, to foster very technical, specific, practical skills, artistic skills. Now, arts is something that involves discipline in a very natural way, persistent effort. You know, when you do something really, really well, there, you find students rare moments where they study history in the way they study the arts. No. Something that they take really serious, that they want to bring to perfection and where they see perfection. This kind of technical skills are very rare. We wish we would do more of that in other disciplines, not just in the arts. No. Uh, to develop skills that are close to the technical skills of the activity outcomes, obviously to develop skills that are not directly uh, related to arts education, but that come with it. You know, it's a non-school type activity, it's a social activity, it's a performing activity, and actually later in life you're gonna come back to this more and more and more and more situations. No? And then last but not least, we think it's also important the kind of habits of minds that are actually shaped in this. No? Creativity, again, persistence, discipline. No? Some things are better caught than taught. And there, sort of arts and music education can be a very, very powerful way to actually get us there. We can also learn uh, the kind of learning styles, the learning environments can be very instructive. Uh, many people talk today about personalized learning. Actually, where you can see that happening is in the arts education. That's where learning is really highly personalized. The students learn to ex envision, to express, to reflect, to engage, and so on. There are also other disciplines that could benefit from the typical visual arts pedagogy, for example, class time, 
that is devo uh, devoted on projects. And everybody here in this conference talks about project-based learning. Well, if you play in an orchestra, that is project-based learning at its very, very best. Now, this is about setting common goals. It's about listening to other people, working with other people, contributing your own expertise, and so on. So many of the things that actually we are just beginning to learn in other disciplines now, are actually done since centuries really, really well in the arts. It's something we can learn. Uh, regular mid-project critiques, actually, you know, the best way to get feedback is in the arts. And if you learn pretty quickly what you're doing well and where you can become better. People around you tell you in a constructive, positive way. So the kind of feedback loops that we wish for in many disciplines are very developed. Peer learning. And if you get, get actually to a good arts lesson, there's a lot less you learn from the teacher and a lot more you learn from your peers in this. Now, you observe others, you learn from them, you discuss, you study. And it's again, it's a style of learning, it's a frame of mind of learning that we would like to see in education. And arts education is a good way to get this. So just wrapping up very briefly, a couple of conclusions on this. Arts for the arts sake, absolutely yes. Now, if we just take the instrumental view on this, arts is good because it serves some other purpose? No. Let's follow the other purpose. No, arts should be seen for its own rational. But again, there are many other bi uh, uh, factors that we have. We did actually a book on that where, we, where you can read all of the evidence that I'm presenting here. And uh, that's really all I wanted to share. Thank you very much. way out of this is to say what he said, <laughs> but I'll add, <clears throat> I'll add a few things perhaps to illustrate some of the points. If you can go to the next slide, please, or shall I use this? There we go. Um, I think one of the most important things uh, going when it comes to being an arts educator is that you have to be completely fascinated with the material and equally fascinated with the students that you're teaching. It's really, really critical. And so on the screen right now, you see my motto. I live it. I have a t-shirt that says this. I wear it anytime I possibly can. I didn't feel like this was quite the venue, although I'm missing a tie. Uh, it's a really, really critical thing. Some people dream of meeting their favorite musicians, and I teach mine. And I think that that's one of the most fascinating things about being an arts educator is you get to see the next generation of fascinating musicians as they're becoming those fascinating musicians. So I have two key principles that I want to talk about today. One has to do with policy and the other has to do with practice. And Andreas has already mentioned this concept of, uh, of arts learning and learning in other subject areas actually having equal footing. I think one of the most critical things in, uh, I will say, public education around the world is that what we fundamentally need is the feeling of equity. We need the feeling of equity when it comes to uh, a fully funded public education for, uh, for all students. But we also need this concept of respect and equity between different subject areas in the school. It starts with curriculum. It moves on to assessment. And it comes through to reporting. The interesting thing about assessment in the arts I find most fascinating is that uh, as a music teacher, when the students uh, walk into the room and they get set up and they start to play, I start to assess, and so do they. And the assessment ends when they leave. The entire time we're making music together, assessment is happening both uh, for the students and for me along with them. It's a fascinating thing. I would say that from my perspective, and this perhaps comes off as a little bit cliche, but it's still totally warranted to be said, the best arts education policy is a comprehensive education policy. Every, every part of a student's learning experience at school should be uh, completely um, equal in its standing and, and priority. Student interest may shape things differently in terms of their engagement, but it's up to us as the, the education system and as teachers to be delivering all of those offerings and options to all of our students. There we go. So to, somewhat to illustrate this, when we talk about music and science, 
uh, for a student in school, they need to be equally learning music content and competencies and science content and competencies. It's that spot in the middle that perhaps their passions start to emerge and they start to think about, well, I like music and I like science, so maybe I could find a career there. Well, you sure could. Uh, in instrument design, electronics design, in acoustical engineering, there's this, these magical ways to take two particular uh, interests in their academic life and their school life and put those together to, far, to carve out a, a career or some sort of uh, life journey beyond uh, their school years. I think it's also important that when we see trends in uh, education creep up like coding, this magic word that is everywhere, that we recognize that there are many ways that arts education can uh, be uh, the place to be learning about coding. If we use traditional Western music notation, every time a student writes a whole note and then another student reads a whole note, they've just codified and then decoded a particular message. They've created meaning through this codified symbology. And so I always think it's very interesting when uh, an administrator might talk about m money that's coming for coding and they turn to a select group of teachers and say, it's going to be for you, rather than looking at every teacher in the school and saying, where does coding appear in your teaching area? Where, where, how does it manifest itself? How is it a part of your teaching every day? Again, treating all subject areas equally. In terms of the key principle of, uh, around practice, there's something that's very interesting about living in uh, British Columbia. We have an organization called the First Nations Education Steering Committee, and they do some really, really wonderful work in helping to connect uh, our indigenous populations across British Columbia and non-indigenous populations. And I think what's really, really critical is this notion of relational pedagogy. This document is called the First People's Principles of Learning, and it reads like a really wonderful philosophy of education. I think to any arts educator, they feel maybe an even closer relationship to it because of the way that we share with our students our own experiences, our own artwork that we've created, our own processes that we go through to develop whatever our artwork may be. And this one particular principle from, the, from this document uh, about learning being holistic, reflexive, reflective, experiential, and relational. And it's relational that stands out the most to me. On the last slide, there was a quote from a guy named uh, Dr. Tim Lotzenheiser, as he talks about, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. It's about setting up this concept where, yes, arts education is at the center of what we do, but it's a shared experience. There's nowhere else in the school for me and in my experience, and I'm sure the others might agree, where students and teacher get to do the exact same thing together for the same purpose and authentically share an experience. When I'm conducting a band of 165 students or a choir of 210, there is something really, really magical about this uh, totally spontaneous experience that we have together. It's entirely temporal, and yet it leaves such an indelible mark on their school experience, which they carry out into many different things in many different parts of their lives. I know I've seen my students move beyond the K-12 system into really unique learning experiences and finding ways to, to take music beyond their school life. And I think that's one of the most uh, the, what's one of the best things to see? That music didn't end when they finished in high school, that it kept going. And it's the same for my colleagues in dance and visual art and drama as well. Thank you. I'm the short one. Hi, everybody. Let's see if I can make it work. Oh, there I am. So uh, I'll start out by saying, and y'all I'm sure have heard, music is a universal language. And so you can take me or any of my colleagues and put me in a different place where maybe we can't speak the same language, but we do speak the same language, if that makes any sense to you. And we can communicate and make wonderful music together and, and have a meaningful, lasting experience that 
will likely last a memory in our, in our lives forever. It's also international, as you can see. So in the back, that happened to be a, a shot that they took at the concert where um, I was learning alongside my students, and we had been doing that for about three years. So that was a, this is year three of perfecting our, far from perfecting our Tycho, but it looks pretty good, right? Um, so uh, it's international. And so it naturally brings a global perspective, and we're here talking about uh, globalized instruction or global classrooms or global competence or what makes a real global citizen. And I can tell you from my, ex my nine years of experience in the school that I built this program from the bottom up. And when I say from the bottom up, I walked in the doors and there was not one instrument to be had. We started out, out on Home Depot buckets. And by the time I left, we had um, instruments from Japan, instru instruments from Cuba, instruments from Africa, instruments from the Middle East, instruments from, uh, from Hawaii. Uh, I can go on and on. We had instruments from almost every corner of the world. Now, when you talk about percussion, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of instruments. So I didn't have hundreds of thousands of instruments, but for sure, um, we touched in the local community, uh, we counted 3,800 people uh, were part of our drum circle. I think that's what landed me here. Thank you. As a young musician, I'd like to go to talking um, about something that was already touched on by Mr. Schleicher. Was, um, as a young musician, if you can remember, if any, any of you were in that position, uh, you're perfecting something that you love. You love passionately. And I remember myself in my lessons as a high school student. I started playing classical guitar. Before that, I was a, a trumpet player, a reluctant trumpet player. I didn't want to play the trumpet. But when I got to high school, I had an opportunity to change my instrument. Now, if I were to pick up the trumpet now, I would love it, I'm sure. But as a little girl, fourth grader, the last thing I wanted to do was play the trumpet. But that's what I was given. That was the gift I was given. And I didn't appreciate it then, but I'm sure I would appreciate it now. As I got to high school, I was given a different gift. I got the gift of the classical guitar, or the guitar, which I decided for me was classical. That's where my passion went. And I spent hours not doing my homework, but really working hard at perfecting my ability as a classical guitarist. Now, me not doing my homework didn't hold me back from going to college. I got a scholarship to uh, one of the top 10 music schools in the country. So, I, I mean, my, my homework got done, and I had, enough, you know, a high enough grades to get me in. But it was my passion that really got me to where I am today. Um, so I remember um, thinking about flow, um, the Roschiato technique on flamenco, and I really wanted to get it right because I, I, you know, I really wanted to sound authentic, just like Paco Pena. And then, oh, it was my audition for college, and I had to play something classical. I had to play something Bach. So I had my Roschiato got put to the side, or at least for that practice session, and I really had to get really refined on my arpeggios because I needed to nail that classical Bach piece in order to really impress the auditioners. And then I got really hooked on Ar Argentinian tango, so Yo-Yo Ma. I was listening to Yo-Yo Ma play his Argentinian tango. Was, I can do that on the guitar. And so I started to listen to the different rhythms and pick up the music, and I really tried to create that in my instrument or on my instrument. And then moving towards cl uh, contemporary music, where I was studying the music of Cuban composer um, Leo Brower on the guitar and playing in ensembles with other people. And when you're playing in ensembles with other people, you you do, you learn those those communication um, things that, you've, that get you through life, that make it possible for me to connect with people on a very, very personal level. And, and to create art with people across borders. And I'll talk to you about that later, and I'm pointing to my fabulous friend right here. Um, I want to switch this and see where I can get you. Yeah, there should be something. Oh, that's here. Okay. Um, so it's encompassing all different cultures, and that's at least what I want to tell you is, that, you know, I'm not just the one kid that's thinking globally as a, as a person who's studying music. When you're studying music, you think globally. 
It's not something that a teacher says to you. You're going to think globally now, and we're going to study cu Cuban music, and we're going to pick up a Cuban drum. It's something that you just do naturally. It's in you. And in the bands, I'm sure when you're conducting your bands, you're getting music from all different parts of the world. You have Russian composers, and you have Italian composers, and we're going to play Mozart today, and tomorrow we're going to play some Swearingen some, you know, from today. So, I mean, it's just what happens as you're learning to be a musician. It's not something that's scripted. It's not put into the curriculum. It's already there. Um, so if we're talking about creating real global citizens, arts education is really where you have to start. Um, then they wanted me to talk about um, thinking globally. And like I said, you know, it's kind of already in there. But I had to create uh, a, pro a program, music program, from the bottom up with nothing. And here's $20,000, and you need to outfit your music program. But it's going to come in in dribs and drabs. So, so what are you going to start with? And what I started with was acquiring drums, well, before from Home Depot, and then drums from different parts of the world. And the first things that came in were I had Cuban drums and African drums. They came in together. So we were putting together our Cuban and our, our African together. I mean, we fused it. The kids, you know like how you eat Chinese food? You have an experience with the Chinese culture while you're eating. Right? Or you go to a, a store and you find some kind of clothing that's very reminiscent of, I don't know, maybe um, the beautiful Middle Eastern wear that we're seeing um, here. And you like it. You appreciate it. It's got great color. It's got great design. And you get it, and it reminds you of things like that. Well, at least that's how it does for me because that's how I think. Um, you bring that into your classroom, and you wind up fusing these um, sounds together and I have a little video here. How do I play it? So that's all my drums all together. How's it? It's cool, right? Th those are drums from, okay, so that's four different continents of drums. There's your melody. Now this melody, anybody recognize this melody? This comes from a, um, well we learned it from an African, um, it's, it's called the Fanga, and it's, it's a community building. It's like come together, we're all friends, we are a community. Now we can, I think we can stop it because I only have 10 minutes, but you want to listen to the whole thing, right? I know. That by the way is the, the album cover from our CD that the Grammy Foundation helped us release. Um, yeah, very cool, right? That, that was the school I was at. And now if I go, now what we do is we take those um, African rhythms or whatever rhythm we're studying with Japanese, you saw the Japanese, and then we look for their influence on our popular music. So if we can go to the next slide, you'll see another. Um, it, no, no, go back, yep. So this is how the, the kids find this music, right? The, they, they tell me what they want to play. Very similar, right? There's the influence, same instruments. Listen, you'll, you'll know this tune, I think. So I'm talking a lot about drums, but there's melodies, right? There's our percussion melody. Know that tune? Same drum groove. You can stop it. Because we really want to listen to it all day long, but. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Time? Okay. All right, so let me just show you real quick, and she's telling me to get off the stage. But. I know, I know, I know. Can I just show you the, the best part about being a global educator? Okay, because you know you want to be global educators if you're not already, and I'm sure we're sitting in this room, we all already are. Um, we're collaborating now. So these are orchestra kids, brand new orchestra kids. And you see on the screen, that's Andre. Andre is so cool. Andre is an eighth grader, now going into a ninth grader. Now, see, I'm pointing, there's my friend. He's a ninth grader. He came into my classroom on that screen, and he taught my beginning string players to play um, a Suzuki piece. And that was all through Skype. 
So there are other things that we do real quick. Um, that's a video. We won't play it because I'll get the hook. Um, but <laughs> that was a live performance. So that's Cherry Children's Center in, Q um, in, Ni in Nairobi. And so what we did was we played with them. They sent us a video because we can't really do it in real time. So they sent us a video. We played that and we played around them. And, and we're still using our global collaborations. That was um, a national collaboration with Cincinnati's um, uh, Cleveland. Cleveland's Institute for, for Music is working with our jazz band over Skype. Like, there's endless possibilities. And, and I know Mark said this, and I'm going to just finish up with that. Um, you see this guy right here? He started with me as a ninth grader, a troubled ninth grader. Oh, my gosh. One of the pains in the coolies. But I loved him, and, and now he's uh, uh, on his path to a doctorate in music, mm -hmm. and he tours the country, and actually the world, I will say, because he's on a China, uh, an Asian circuit right now, um, with Yut and the Hot Four, if you ever get a chance to go see him. Mm -hmm. He's the guy wearing the cape. Does that mean I get? Does that mean I get seven and a half minutes? <laughs> <laughs> I have two confessions. One. I'm sorry. Oh no worries. Thank you, <laughs> Melissa, for sharing your music. I have two confessions. First one, uh, it's difficult for me to share about arts education or music without sharing uh, what my some of my students do. So just to start off, I'll show a clip of um, the boys from my choir. I I'm a principal of a boys school in Hong Kong, the Dawson Boys School. We started out as an orphanage 148 years ago. Mm. Uh, there's a um, there's a Dawson and Girls School, but uh, I'm on the boys' side. And so I'd just like to show you a clip of uh, the things that they've been doing. This is a clip from last year, please. You come on the good tree, peaches and cream, lips like strawberry wine. You're 16, you're beautiful, and you're mine. So Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, they performed in Reno last year. Um, my second, my second confession. Um, two days ago, we started our training at uh, the VTA training. Um, in the morning, at 8-ish, eight, we moved into the auditorium. Uh, our leaders, our advisory staff, were sharing uh, what we're going to what we're going to be looking forward to, uh, the kind of training, the kind of bonding that we're going to have. So I was smiling outside and very excited, looking very excited. But I have to confess that inside, I was a little bit down and it was a little bit sad because uh, the conductor, uh, his name is Felix, uh, just texted me. And uh, I received a, a, a short WhatsApp message from him, and he said, oh, sorry, Mr. Chang. Nothing earth-shattering, but um, it just so happened that while I was sitting in the, in, the, in the auditorium, getting ready, looking forward to all the training and um, all the bonding, he was leading the boys to competition, and somehow uh, they didn't receive the, the, the result that they were looking forward to. And the re for me, the competition result doesn't matter as much, but I felt a little bit sad for him and the boys because I know the time that they put into it. Um, they, they work three times a week. They come back every day during Christmas holidays. Uh, they come back to work uh, during Chinese New Year's. Uh, they bond, the, the older kids bond with the younger kids. They try to bring them up, uh, pass the torch and everything. And so I was smiling at whoever's on stage, you know, nodding and then texting my colleague Felix, actually my ex-student, and trying to console him. And Felix texted me and then Sam texted me. And I, wouldn't, I want to use Felix and Sam's story to illustrate what we're trying to do at school and probably uh, duplicating this uh, in many, many schools. Uh, Felix started out um, as a gifted singer. I discovered him when he was a student of mine in grade nine. I tested him, thought he sounded good, and invited him to, to sing in the choir. And then later on, he went, graduated and went to college and studied biochemistry. And by the third year, he realized that he, that's not what he wanted. And so he called me and said he wanted to turn into music, uh, to study music. So he came back and worked as a, a teaching assistant. 
and then uh, after a while he went back to graduate school and did his uh, music and then now is back uh, leading the choir and you see the product um, the, the work that he does with with the students the other gentleman that texted me that same morning was Sam Sam started out uh, in our school as a student he worked uh, in the last desk of the orchestra, there's a certain hierarchy in the orchestra, I'm sure you understand. He worked from the very last stand all the way to becoming the concert master. And then he decided to go into music and he studied um, viola performance. And after he graduated from uh, undergraduate school, he got accepted to Juilliard to uh, study viol viola performance. And I said, okay, go ahead and study. And then a couple weeks later, he texted me again and he said, Mr. Chang, I decided to come back. I want to teach the boys because if I go to graduate school, then I'd miss the entire class of boys that I could shepherd. And so he came back and became uh, the teacher. Hopefully we'll have time to watch him in action also. So Felix and Sam uh, grew up in the system. And what kind of system is that? Uh, what kind of arts uh, education system did we build? And before we, before we answered that question, actually we started with another question. Said, the question is this, what do adolescents, uh, what, do as, what do teenagers actually need when they grow up? Um, for boys, they need a tribe, they need a sense of identity, they need a sense of hierarchy, not to be dominated, but they need to see somebody, perhaps more advanced, uh, somebody who's uh, more senior, and see what they're doing and model or pattern after them. Um, some of my other students from the girls' school um, I know I'm generalizing here, but they need a, a nurturing, a supportive environment. And so, um, and they all need a rite of passage. They need to do something uh, major in their eyes and in their hearts to, to help them maybe grow up and reach adulthood. And so by answering these questions first, and then going back to how we design our curriculum, um, this is the system that we came up with. And by building the system, we know that uh, they will soar, and empowering them to take the self-initiative to perpetuate this. And so we, we built a program where students take the lead, where they feel empowered to uh, lead their, their ensembles. And so at our school, we have six graded choirs, uh, three for, for boys, one when they sing with a treble voice, and then one after their voice break, and then one for the seniors, and then they have three corresponding mixed choirs. And then for students who play the instruments, they can play in the orchestra, play, they can play in the string orchestra, the wind orchestra, or the Chinese instrument orchestra. And so in our school, uh, in the high school, we have about 13, hundred students and about four to five hundred of them participate in music and I think it's self-perpetuating once something resonates among the uh, amongst the hearts of the boys um, we don't think about boys as you know fully committing to the arts or to music but when they when they find the ensemble as a tribe or something that they can identify with that they can grow up through through it and find certain expression that they cannot express through words or sometimes uh, even through their emotions. Um, they find an outlet there. And so they find the identity, they find the, the cohesion there. And from there we, we grow from uh, local uh, performances and then we bring them out. Uh, Melissa made a good point. For musicians, we don't need to consciously try to make them global citizens. Naturally, they embrace um, by way of improving their skills, by way of improving their, expanding their repertoire, they embrace different cultures. And so we try to do that through music and we try to rally. Uh, we don't have much, in fact, we don't receive arts funding, extra funding from, from the government. So we try to rally the community, we try to rally the alumni to support these boys. And so for uh, 20 years, I was trying to build that and now on the other side, as a school administrator and as a headmaster, I am trying to do, I'm trying to protect this environment where our students can continue to grow in this, uh, so, and our teachers can nurture this environment and maintain this culture where Mr. Schleicher mentioned. He, he's given you the evi evidences and the facts and the figures. And it's, it's a precious environment when students, especially nowadays, when they can listen to each other and work with each other instead of fighting for positions, you know, and collaborating 
and creating something truly special that they cannot uh, accomplish alone. And then on the administrative side, on the system side, I tried, I tried to design the timetable where they can have a longer lunch, not to hop over to the girls' school to have lunch with the girls, <laughs> but to have uh, rehearsal time. You know, the boys, uh, the students, they would uh, have a quick lunch for about 15, 20 minutes and they'll get a full hour of rehearsal. And then they will be rehearsing again after school. But, you know, knowing Asians, you know, we have to dive back into our books uh, pretty soon. And so uh, I'm trying to, you know, what we're trying to do is to protect this environment where they can really grow holistically and, uh, uh, and uh, in an all-rounded way. And finding the right personnel to teach the different types of students, the novices and the experts. And also my task, of course, is to persuade the parents that this thing that we're doing is truly special and lifelong. And so, uh, but at the end of the day, I'm trying to protect something, or we're all in this room trying to protect something. Um, you can call it creativity, you can call it curiosity, you can call it passion, but the, at the end of the day, and this is my third confession, I really don't think that there's a word for it. Whenever people say arts education, I cringe a little bit. When people say passion, I cringe a little bit because I find that through my 20 years of working in the arts or working with music or whatever craft that you're doing in dance, in pottery, in literature, there's something that you cannot, that there's something that, that's unspeakable or it, words cannot describe. Uh, I know I'm contradicting myself a little bit. I'm a literature, obviously, you know, it's, it's a sublime level of, but there's something deep inside uh, that I can't, quite put words to it, but I'm sure it's in each one of you because as a school administrator, uh, this is something that I need to protect or enhance within the teachers because at the end of the day, the students will be inspired by you and this is my task or our task because once you tap into that thing that's inside, uh, it gives life to everything. It gives life to everything else. It resonates with who they are and why they're here and it's not just sound or uh, dexterity or anything. It's, it's not just creativity, it's something more. Uh, I want to take sports as an example. When you watch Federer, Roger Federer play, you don't see it as sport. It, it's something else completely on a different plane. It engages the whole being and it gives life to all his, other, his or her other endeavors. And it gives true meaning to life and it gives them a true calling in life when they tap into this. And perhaps, once again, it all starts with us as um, school leaders and as arts teachers, that we can find the deep meaning in our lives. When we can find it in ours, it will resonate in them. And, these, and this reson deep, resonation, deep resonance will sow seeds in their lives and hopefully uh, grow into something uh, wondrous and beautiful. I have one last clip, I don't know if I have time quick uh, on the instrumental side. These are the boys playing uh, the final minutes of uh, Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. And this is Sam, who came back to uh, teach the orchestra.
Thank you very much. presentations from the coalface of the arts and a really fascinating one from Andreas there. Ronnie, I have to say to you, in many, many years of listening to discussions about the arts, I have rarely heard anyone put so powerfully the thing here that hits you with the arts when you see a great painting or you hear a great piece of music. And uh, I wish we could bottle that and take it away with us. Absolutely wonderful. One thing that struck me before I open it up to you all is we were all emotionally connected with those presentations and in particular with the music as we heard it. And I know one area where there have been studies, for example, is in choirs to um, promote happiness. And one word that hasn't cropped up very much today so far, at least at the sessions I've been to, has been happiness. And the one place it did crop up was in a rather depressing context when somebody casually mentioned that British teenagers are amongst the unhappiest in the world, which, as a Brit, you know, we're not thrilled about. I don't know why that is. Um, I can make a few guesses post-June last year, but, you know, anyway, we'll put that to one side. <laughs> but clearly, happy people are more productive better at studying, better than everything, better at everything than unhappy people. So that's something to think about to kick the discussion off. Now, I'm sure I would like to ask you a million questions, but I'm not allowed to. So I'm going to take questions in groups of three. I would like them to be questions, not PhD theses, please. Um, and if you would like them directed at a particular person on the panel, that's fine. Otherwise, I'm going to, after each cluster of three, I'm going to go through the panel and um, invite people to address whichever of the questions they would like to address. Please wait for the microphone to reach you. So, yes, uh, lady there. Uh, can you wait for the microphone, please? Hi, great presentation, all of you. I really loved it. Um, I actually, uh, I'm not in the teaching, but I send students to study and advise parents where to put the school, the, the, which school to go to and which program to choose. And I don't know if you know, most of the government schools in the Gulf, they don't teach art. Mm. We have an art lesson, which is like maybe one hour a week. And all of all the time, this hour is confiscated by the math teacher or the or the science teacher. <laughs> when they can't finish the program, they come and take the art lesson. Lesson, and so what can you do? What can the OECD do to convince the governments that art can, you know, st studying art can actually enhance creativity in the students? Okay, thank you very much. Next question, yes, lady uh, in this row here. Yeah, hi, it goes actually very much in the same direction. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, as a parent, not as an educator, I have two, two students here in Dubai in a school having exactly this problem that um, in favor of STEM education, um, our music uh, education is completely cut off from my students, um, from my, for my kids. They don't have any music um, lessons anymore, um, and only every second week they have an art lesson, um, which is obviously uh, horrible also for the students because they actually took always these uh, art lessons and music lessons as a break in between all this uh, fact and figures. So I wanted to ask you whether you can give me some arguments for the principle because I'm fighting for this for the last year to get back my music and art classes for my children. Um, if you can give me some arguments what I can actually hit him with because he, he is a physic, physics teacher and he really is about the STEM very much and now we have seven lessons of maths every week but we don't have any art lessons, and now for next year, he's even planning to cut off the PE lessons. Okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, on that front, I think you've just heard some quite strong arguments, but maybe one thing, you, I'm, I'm sure Andreas will answer the question, but one thing maybe you could do is read the publication from the OECD that he talks about the research and, uh, you know, knock him flat with that. Third question, can you pl keep your questions very snappy, please? So, um, uh, woman there, please. Hi. Um, would someone be able to provide an example of, a, of uh, a way in which they succeeded to achieve arts funding or programming in their institution? Um, 
as something beneficial in this context. Okay. Okay, so that was uh, two questions about um, arguing about, well, basically, what the hell do you do when you haven't got any arts provision in the Gulf states? Um, and the other was about uh, arts funding. Can you give successful examples of how you have managed to get arts funding? Of course, we are operating in different cultures, so that's a particular challenge there. Uh, Melissa, we'll start with you. Well, I, I think that they're better suited to tackle the, pri the, the principal issue. So I'm going to leave that one alone. But um, the arts funding, actually, the Tyco grant came in for three years in a row, actually not through arts, through language. Um, so there's crafty ways that you can go around the, the bend to get them. Because in that school, even though you see some wonderful products, I got zero dollars except for the $20,000 nine years ago. Zero. Mark. Okay, so if there isn't uh, a presence of arts education in schools, uh, from a very principled perspective, I'm okay with that, and I'll explain why. Because there are parts of the world where it's not, where school isn't the place for that learning, but the community provides that learning, or it's done through cultural exercise, uh, through religious uh, participation. There, there, are, there are many ways that students engage in uh, an arts making, whether it's music or it's dance or uh, it, it's drama or it's art. It could be anything. And I think in relation to the, the STEM-related question, especially when it comes to something like uh, a principal being uh, from a physics background, it's awfully unfortunate that a physicist fails to recognize their obvious connection <laughs> with music making. That's a shame. Um, and I think that in, for both of the, the, the questions that have been raised from the front to tie into the one at the back, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to money, um, I, I guess I'm innovative in two ways. I suppose I'm innovative in my teaching practice, but I'm also innovative in the ways that I can become ridiculously insistent to the, to the point of, uh, of being irritating. Um, <laughs> I have wonder, had wonderfully patient principles. Um, I had a, a wonderfully supportive uh, fine arts uh, uh, consultant in our school district who at many times have said, what will it take for me to get you out of my office or <laughs> off the phone? And, and that's, that is in large part because you can walk in with an argument and you can keep talking about students. So I had one year where I had two tubas. The two tubas were probably manufactured and acquired in the early 50s. This was only a few years ago. And because of the way that retention was going, I was going to need eight tubas for the senior band the following year. Uh, a tuba runs uh, at the lowest end, about 8,000 US. So that meant that I needed to find a lot of money. And uh, basically, uh, as part of being the CEO of a moderately sized music organization in a school, uh, go out and, uh, and literally beat the drum. And it took getting on the phone with people and saying, here's my situation. I'm going to have to tell these kids they can't be in band. And there's something about uh, student enrollment and their passion that is an incredibly compelling argument to turn someone around to say, I'm going to help you find $65,000. When the two all arrived for the following September, uh, I had a number of friends who had a lot of questions. Where did these come from? How did you get this money? And I'd give them the exact same answer. Don't take no. If kids want to be in the program, if they want that learning, it is the school's obligation to provide that learning and the resources and materials to do it. Andreas. Yeah, I, I think the, the question on, you know, relative priorities is always a hard one. And uh, I don't think the issue is that much just about governments. Actually, governments are fairly familiar with the evidence. And they, in those people who design national curricula are also sort of very keen to develop a holistic view uh, on student learning and a less instrumental view on learning. The pressure often comes from things like, you know, exam systems. Uh, if at the end of the day, what we actually value to get access to university is, you know, math and th science, and that's going to dominate students' learning. The pressure also comes from, from parents. If parents have to make choices, you know, do I put one more hour into this or, th or that? And, and, and this is where actually arts and, uh, and, and music uh, have are losing out. When it comes to that kind of zero-sum game, uh, thinking. At the very same time, I'm in one way also optimistic because actually when you look at the latest efforts in curriculum design across countries over the last five years, actually the arts have increased. I think there's greater recognition these days than in the past that, you know, 
learning is more about than the development of cognitive skills, that the kind of character qualities, you know, resilience, curiosity, confidence, courage, leadership, all of those are very, very closely to, related to the arts. I do think that's something that public policy is recognizing. You can see this even, I, could, I didn't show you the trend measures, but if you look at short-term trends, there's actually been greater emphasis more recently in many countries, not all, there are some countries going in the opposite direction. So I think there is uh, recognition on the importance of those subjects uh, for the development of individuals. Uh, sure, I think we all can do better work in creating better awareness. And I think the best way the arts themselves can do that in, in, in sort of strengthening the interrelationships with other disciplines in the school and fostering greater collaboration within the school across the disciplines. I mean, the, the sad thing is, you know, this is not just a matter of curriculum design at the macro level. We can see the same thing playing out within schools. There are debates between uh, s uh, teachers of different disciplines, you know, fighting for a zero-sum territory. And I think that's the, that's the place best to start with the discussion. How can different disciplines actually reinforce and strengthen themselves? But um, overall, I really think you know about five, six years ago, we reached a turning point where the decline in, in arts actually turned around, and we see now greater emphasis on those. Thank you, Ronnie. Yeah, on a micro level, I want to pick up on that micro level, especially on a school level. Um, we've also gone through periods where resources w have been scarce. You know, buying instruments have been difficult, and we need to find sources where you know perhaps from the mainland where it's cheaper and stuff. But I, I, I want to come to the most central. Uh, I feel that is the most important issue here is uh, we need to find the right teacher. And I'm not sure uh, if your principal or um, the leader of the school concurs and if you whether you have a say in terms of uh, fielding the right teaching staff. But if there are, there's an opportunity to hire n a new teacher or if the teacher can do two subjects or on a very pr practical level. If we can find the right teacher that can spark the student, we can do a lot with uh, very few resources mm. and then perhaps build from there. And I think principals by and large are very pra pragmatic people. The government is very pragmatic people. If they see something growing and if they see a bit of evidence in that, I think they will be a little bit more generous in their support. Mm, thank you. Next cluster of three snappy questions. Uh, you, sir? Yeah, I just want to bring it to the classroom level. You know, we teach different types of subjects, you know. And one thing I found interesting when I heard uh, Melissa's video, you know, there was a great different impact here. Everybody was interested. So whether you all can come up to get, come up with some musical tools or musical forms which we as teachers can use in classrooms to make the classroom a little bit more interesting uh, like you know tried and tested methods or something like that some musical forms so which can be incorporated in our teaching and learning thank you um, you you in the blue shirt <laughs> hello um, I know that all three of you are incredible music teachers, um, but we know that there are other uh, disciplines within the arts. And even schools that provide arts programs usually do it uh, either through music or visual arts. Uh, but we know that uh, drama and dance are often um, not, don't show up in a lot of school curriculums. And uh, I'm just wondering if you could touch on that topic on how we could advocate to get more um, of all of the different arts disciplines into school curriculum. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, you in the green shirt. Up here. It's there. Sorry. Yeah. So there's a, now a new movement of adding arts within the STEAM as such, uh, integrating it with the STEM subjects. What's your view on that? And what kind of arts can be included within the STEM? Great. Thank you. So we've got tools for teaching music in the staff room are there uh, in the classroom uh, in the staff room would also be interesting um are there any uh, apart from what you've just seen and bottling it and taking it away um we've got integrating uh, the arts with stem subjects and we've got bringing in other art forms i agree it's a shame we haven't got um 
other art forms represented here. I, I, I interviewed um, Michael Lamaya earlier. I mean, what a guy, what a guy. And interestingly, what he says about uh, dance in, in relation to relating to other people, all those, so, I mean, I, I even don't like calling it social skills because it seems demeaning to have to give it the kind of jargon-ridden name like that. It's not about that, it's about being a human being and how you relate to other human beings, and that's really what we're talking about. So, over to the panel. Uh, we'll start the other side, at the other end this time. So, Ronnie. Sure. Um, first question about incorporating other art forms in the school. Uh, what we did at school is that um, the teacher managed to convince the principal, uh, you're looking at him, I guess, uh, <laughs> that uh, <laughs> drama is useful for teaching language. And so uh, what we did, uh, I, we can't cover all the artwork, but um, art forms, but in drama, we, we are asking across the board, all grade seven students, they, for example, they have eight periods per week in English. Uh, two of them would be in drama because uh, it helps them um, in terms of writing scripts, they can you know, s formulate their thoughts, put it in action. Uh, students can act it out, they can speak it, they can act it. And so uh, for all grade seven students, we, we have incorporated drama into the languages. I wonder if this can help you convince your school. Mm. Uh, in, in grade eight, we have um, debate. And then in grade nine, we have film to accompany uh, languages. Again, once again, it, it's a different way of helping uh, teenagers to learn languages in a lively way. And so you're incorporating arts into the requisition of language, and perhaps that might help. And STEAM, definitely, putting the arts in it is, is great. We're uh, incorporating calligraf calligraphy, visual arts, and perhaps computer uh, graphics into it. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're still learning how to fully integrate everything, but uh, perhaps it's something that we can do. Great. Andrea? You know, one simple answer why we see a lot less drama in, uh, than, than music is that teaching drama and the performing arts well is much, much harder to do. And that's simply, I mean, it's, re it's really one of the things, one of the most challenging things to teach well in a school to teach those kinds of skills. But that doesn't, shouldn't take anything away. It should just call us to, to actually do these things better. And about the integration of arts and, and STEM, actually, if you look to the real world, uh, modern STEM work has a lot in common with arts. You know, if the creative aspect is obvious, but also things like design thinking. You know, uh, those aspects are very, very key to doing STEM today because the other parts have been digitized, automated. Now, STEM today, the kind of research, uh, so I do think in the real world they are integrated. We have still a hard time in the school world in doing this, and I think we have in the, in, in schools in general. I'm not just talking about us. Become much better at thinking, helping students learn to think across the boundaries of subject matter disciplines to better integrate. You know, project-based learning provides actually a platform to do those things in sync, and it will help. You know, but it is something that. Uh, Honestly, we see, still see education systems struggling with because we have this kind of disciplinary boundaries and barriers, and that's where we educate teachers. Right? Teachers are taught to teach, you know, science or music or arts, but creating those kinds of interfaces is something that most school systems struggle with. But in the real world, that is precisely how things have arrived. Right? And uh, we are also sort of one of the things that happen is that every day we put something more on top of the education system. Now, like we, someone said coding, you know, now we say, well, every three-year-old has to learn coding. By the time those people will graduate, people will ask them, why did you learn coding? You know, that is so outdated, that's so automated. Now. And uh, I think this is sort of one of the, one of the dilemmas that we have to have. We have this kind of silos of disciplines and then um, forget about the interconnections between them. And I think that is what good instruction really is about. You know. um, could I ask Mark and Melissa to address the issue that the gentleman there raised about mm -hmm. resources? Because not everybody is mm. naturally inspirational teacher in the classroom, and you know, some of us need help in all kinds of areas. So, yeah. um, I think it's really important to know that there are organizations like the International Society for Music Education. Um, that organization has 85 countries uh, represented within it, uh, where there are music researchers and practitioners engaged in these 85 countries that are, are certainly willing to, um, to support and connect. Um, I currently am the past president of the Canadian uh, Music Educators Association, and so we're the, the representative body to, uh, to ISMI, and we do a lot of work uh, within our own country that we're certainly happy to share beyond. So uh, 
I'm happy to chat after about connecting you with some people that d are creating their own resources out of need and necessity. Uh, some of them are creating their own resources because of uh, regional need. Uh, we have certain teachers in our, uh, in, in I would say every province, that are working to incorporate uh, the music and perspective and worldview of our Aboriginal people. So they're thinking really, really openly about how do I uh, learn music from around the world, learn music from my own uh, country, without uh, entering into a role of cultural appropriation. So it's not just accessing the resource, but it's being mindful of the engagement of the resource um, as, a, as a package. Um, on the other question, I, I, I want to say something that could essentially be quite provocative. I, I <laughs> completely dislike STEAM. I completely dislike STEM. I think it is so wrong. I think it, it, it narrows the focus for our students on one narrow scope of possibility for their lives, rather than this notion of comprehensive education that shows them the possibilities are much more limitless, and that there's this opportunity, like I said in my presentation, to carve out a unique career path because of these sort of a, um, an equation approach. I'm into art, and I'm into science. Mm -hmm. What can I do with that? What are my opportunities? What are my options? And certainly, you know, Mike, who's asked this question about, you know, increasing drama and dance in, in, as part of a comprehensive arts education program in schools, I think it's really important that we turn to our elementary colleagues and we look and see what they're doing with dance connected to music because they're often inextricably linked through uh, Kodai methodology and ORF methodology. And then we also have uh, maybe perhaps the presence of, uh, of uh, exploratory play that's happening with students uh, in the context perhaps of language arts. That that's really their first engagement with drama, whether it's improvised or it's suddenly uh, subtly scripted, that's their first experience. What are we drawing up from that young experience for them in, in those early years of school? Are we giving them something that matches, that, that captures that, or did we retire dance education at grade three? It drives me nuts, the idea that people think that beginning band is beginning music, and yet, there's been a little bit of dance or a little bit of drama in elementary school and then we shelve that and we switch to music because it has something bigger that we can see. It's also crazy expensive. Dance is not. Drama is not. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's, there's something very conflicting about this, this issue that we're out there fighting for money and yet there are alternative programs that could be in schools that are a lot cheaper than $65,000 worth of tubas. <laughs> and writing, by the way, involves a piece of paper and a pen, so it's unbelievably cheap. Um, Melissa. So, um, I, immediately I thought to myself... Um, that thank you, sorry to interrupt you, but Andreas clearly has to go, so thank you very much for your participation. <laughs> Um, ju sorry, just, just to interrupt you for a moment, Melissa, we've been given permission from on high to run a few minutes over because there's nothing at this point. Um, are you happy for us to do one more round of questions, one cluster of three, or would you like to stop after this round? Silence. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll do one more round. Okay, so Melissa, carry on. Um, my, I, think my, my, I think my answer is going to be rather quick because I find that I pull from two primary sources. First, I pull from my students. So if I ever want to know what, what it is I'm going to teach or, or bring in something inventive or, or innovative or something different than is in my brain, I pull from them because they are a wealth of, of creativity and desire. So in my classroom, it, I didn't, while I didn't start out my career flipped, as the facilitator, I started out very traditionally with the conducting baton, and I was the conductor. Um, I really kind of uh, graduated into facilitatorship, and the students, all the music that you hear is student-driven. All the ideas that you hear are student-driven. So it, it makes it harder for me get initially in the beginning of the year to, to start to reframe my, my curriculum on what it is that I've let them choose. But... Um, uh, it's incredibly rewarding for both myself and my students. But I also thinking, I'm thinking under the house that we're in right now, and, and maybe it's sounding marketing, but it's not intended to be marketing, but the Varkey Foundation is identifying some pretty amazing people in, in every content area. And we have some dance, um, some drama this year, which we hadn't had before. Mark and I were in the first music 
um, house and we, we're getting more and more people that you can pull from. So if you were to go into the Global Teacher Prize finalists and you were to contact them, I know if you contact me, I will chat with you anytime, any day. Great. And, and, and I know because I'm on the phone with her and I'm on the phone with her and he and I text a thousand times a week and I can call these guys at any time. I know that any of them would. Great. Um, okay, I'm going to take two more questions. Um, Okay. Oh, no, you, sorry, you've already asked one. I've got to be fair here. Um, guy there, yep. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to ask, is it uh, taught uh, today at uh, the uh, music uh, schools or uh, universities uh, that, uh, as a scientific fact, that uh, sound uh, was the first physical reality of uh, creation at large? Looks Which like a no. <laughs> Looks like a no, that one. We'll get huh? two more. We'll get two more. Um, you had your hand up before. Yeah. S sorry, wait for the mic, please. Hi, um, I'm Lena Benetta from UNESCO. And for me, it's uh, uh, very interesting the personal experiences you have sh uh, shared, how um, arts education was strengthened in your schools. It seems it depends on a, often on personal initiative by the principal or teachers. I mean, from your perspective, how do you think more schools can take this on and more teachers can uh, have these innovative approaches? Like, for example, how can it be better mainstreamed in education policy, teacher training, I mean, curriculum, I mean, from a broader, top, uh, uh, central perspective? Nice small question to end <laughs> with. <laughs> um, uh, okay, your, your um, uh, challenge is uh, snappy answers on, uh, on that enormous question. Uh, Ronnie first. For Asia, uh, something related. I think we need to deal with the Education Bureau first. Uh, they need to loosen the grip on exams, at, at least in Asia. I can't speak for the rest of the world. <laughs> if we want to create kids who are all-rounded, then loosen the grip on the exams first, especially the public exams. I think a lot of families know the virtue of the arts, but they, they, there's nothing they can do. You know, it's a do-or-die exam, so loosen the exams first. Mm, okay. Mark? I'm not the only one who said something provocative. That's great. <laughs> Um, I'm going to answer both questions in one. I think I've got a way that I can do it. Um, we make, I think we make arts education work in schools because we don't teach arts education uh, on its own. There's a, a, a sort of clever uh, analogy that is an argument that's entirely futile about the fact that arts educators should be paid eight times what other educators should be paid. <laughs> I teach physics. I teach math. I teach uh, language arts, I teach uh, history, I really teach history. There's no way to teach music without addressing history. Um, we also teach a, a, a really interesting form of psychology. And so to go to your question about the origins, you know, the, the, um, the interesting thing is when you have a student that's in, in band or orchestra that joins choir. When they join choir, they're often reluctant initially. They don't have an instrument to hide behind. There's this sudden uh, uh, movement of the sound being produced outside of them as if they're not responsible for it to the sound suddenly being inside the most beautiful instrument case mm -hmm. that humanity will ever know. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really critical that we draw that connection and we show our students that all musicians must sing. It's the same as all drama students must understand what happens on the stage as what happens backstage. Dancers should understand choreography as much as they understand physiology. It's, it's all of these things together that actually make for a really comprehensive experience for students and unfortunately we get the same pay as everybody else. <laughs> well, I agree with you because uh, you know in, in our, at least in my system they're not the English teacher is not complimenting the math teacher, is not complimenting the science teacher, is not complimenting the history teacher, but we have to do that all at one time and tie in what they, the questions that they bring from other areas and bring it into our lessons. So I agree with you. Um, on uh, replicating what we do, I think that's really kind of a tricky situation. I actually, in that situation that you saw, I, re I created that, and that was because I had an ingenious, innovative principle. And when the, um, that was no longer the case, or the appreciation was no longer there, 
I found another ingenious, innovative principle. So I think that if it's not working for you, find something else. And if they want you hard enough, they'll become ingenious, inven inventive principles. Brilliant. Um, alas, we have to stop now, but I really can't thank you enough. Ronnie, Ronnie Cheng, uh, Mark Reed, and Melissa Morris. A really inspirational session. Thank you so much.